We are now coming to the third study in three secret sacrifices. We turn again to Matthew's Gospel in chapter 6. We've already seen the things that Jesus spoke about and um, it's important to notice one big difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. In the way Jesus speaks and gives his word, it's not just that the New Covenant standard is higher. You know that the Old Testament standard said, for example, Matthew 5.21, you shall not commit murder. Matthew 5.22, but I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. So he says in the Old Testament the standard was murder. In the New Testament it is getting angry. Now how many of you believe that? That if you're in the Old Testament then murder makes you guilty. If you're in the New Testament anger makes you guilty. As guilty as a murderer in the Old Testament. Now I'll tell you honestly 99% of believers don't believe that. If they believed it, they'd have got rid of their anger long ago. Uh, but they say, what to do, brother? I just murdered somebody. What to do? I just murdered somebody. Can't help it. This habit of murdering people, you know. I, I inherited it from my father. My father used to murder people. And uh, my grandfather also murdered lots of people. And I just... You know, that's how they talk about anger. My grandfather had this anger. And my father had this anger. We take it lightly. And that's why we never get the victory over it. So, but what I want to point out is that it's not just the standard that is higher. Like in the Old Testament, you shall not commit adultery, verse 27. And then in the New Testament, it's lusting with your heart after a woman is equal to that. But, okay, we know that. In the Old Testament it said, you must not tell a lie when you have, you know, swear an oath on God or the temple or something like that. But in the New Testament, the standard is you must never tell a lie. Whether you are, don't swear at all, there's no need for that, and so on. The Old Testament said you must love your friends and hate your enemies. New Testament said, no, you must love your enemies too. So, we know that the standard is higher, but it is not just that the standard is higher. That's what I want to point out here this evening. It's that the whole way in which Jesus says it is completely different. And I don't know whether you've noticed that. It's very important because when we share God's word with other believers, it's very important that we don't share it in an Old Testament spirit. We must share it not only the New Testament standard, but the New Testament standard must be presented in a New Testament spirit. Otherwise, you know, this is happening in our churches. We're thinking of what is lacking. And what is lacking in some of our churches is that the New Testament standard is being proclaimed in an Old Covenant spirit. What do I mean by that? Supposing it was like this. Supposing Jesus had said, Yeah, the ancients were told, You shall not commit murder, but I say it unto you, You shall not be angry. Did he say that? He didn't say that. Notice that. The Old Testament said, you shall not commit adultery, verse 21. But I say to you, you shall not lust after a woman. Where does it say that, you shall not lust after a woman? You will not find that verse anywhere in the New Testament. Some of you preach it, I know. But it's not in the New Testament. How does Jesus preach it? He says, if a person is angry, he's guilty. It's not, thou shalt not be angry. That is Old Testament. You shall not commit adultery. How does Jesus say it? If you lust after a woman, you have committed adultery. See, it's a different spirit. It's not this, thou shalt, thou shalt not. 
And it's because of this thou shalt and thou shalt not that we have such a lot of legalism in our churches because this list becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Thou shalt not do this and thou shalt not wear these type of clothes and thou shalt not wear that and do this and do that and the other thing. I don't know where anybody was offended by the clothes that we wore this morning. <laughs> but you know I have a scripture for it. Have you found a scripture for colorful clothes? Jesus taught it. Jesus told us to wear colorful clothes. Matthew chapter 6. <clears throat> Uh, Jesus says in verse 28 observe the lilies in the field now they grow they do not toil they spin and even Solomon in all his glory did not clothe himself like one of these he spoke about God's creation not just the lilies I believe he was speaking about all the flowers have you noticed that when God made flowers he did not make them black and white he made them in so many different colors that is the God I worship. And he says, that is how God has clothed them so beautifully. And God can clothe you. What I'm trying to say is, that there's no spirituality in these external things. So the same principle we find when it comes to these three areas of praying, of giving, praying and fasting. In the Old Testament it was, thou shalt pay ten percent. And there are churches today that preach that. But that's Old Testament. But when Jesus said about giving, he didn't say in Matthew 6, 1, you must give money. No. He said, when you give, give it secretly. You see the completely different spirit. And then he said about praying, he didn't say you must pray. Even in Luke 18, 1, he said, men ought always to pray. This thou shalt and thou shalt not spirit was not there in Jesus. He always said, if any man, if you can understand this difference between the old covenant and the new covenant, I really believe it will liberate you and through you many other people will be liberated. In the Old Testament there was no such thing like that. The Lord never told the Israelites, if any man wants to enter the land of Canaan, let him go. No. You see, you got to go and enter Canaan and kill those giants. They didn't go, then they were punished with 38 years more in the wilderness. But when Jesus came, he said, If any man wants to come after me, let him take up his cross and follow me. And there was never any, you must, you must. And when you hear a preacher telling you, you got to do this, you got to do that, yeah, he may be a good man, but he's in the Old Covenant. I believe, I'm not saying, I'm not making this a law. You know, you can take the letter, even of what I'm saying, and bring death into it. I'm talking about, even if you use those words, that the spirit of it must be the spirit of the New Covenant. See, for example, at home, when we speak to our children, all children are under the law. They are not under grace. So you have to keep them under the law. And what do you tell five-year-olds and six-year-olds and ten-year-olds? You shall. You shall not. Why do we tell our children, you shall, you shall not? But I hope you don't tell your wife, you shall, you shall not. I hope not. Because we are not supposed to treat adults like we treat little children. And in the new covenant, God has treats us like adults. And you must also treat each other like adults. And we must preach like adults. Galatians chapter 3 and chapter 4 makes it clear that the Old Testament was children, the New Testament is sons. So, Jesus says, not you must pray, when you pray. You say, Lord, when is that? Well, men ought always to pray. But we have so many people today in Christendom who have written books and made rules as to how much we should give to God. How many hours we must pray every day? They are all very good rules. And I'm sure that many of them, some of them who write it and preach it don't practice it. 
but some of them do practice it. But they bring a lot of people into bondage when they tell people that you must also do it. Think of a mother with many children. Where does she have time to spend two hours a day in prayer? Um, some person who's a full-time worker who's got nothing else to do, he probably has that time. But a person who's single, he has time. And when he makes rules for other people, he brings them into bondage. When a man who is strong makes rules for his weak wife, he brings them into bondage. Jesus always said, if you love me, keep my commandments. There, there was never any compulsion. He just left it to people when the rich young ruler said, no, Lord, I can't give all my money to the poor. No, he said, fine. That's it. Goodbye. So, I, I praise God for this spirit and I want more and more of that spirit in my relationship with others. And when we talk about these sacrifices, please remember this. We're not teaching in the evening, thou shalt sacrifice. No. Once you get that, you're going to be a legalist and you're going to impose that on other people. I don't even tell people, thou shalt not have a television or thou shalt not see a movie. Why do I have to say all these things? I say... Do all to the glory of God. Whatever you do, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. That means if you can do it in fellowship with Jesus, go ahead and do it. I'm not here to make rules for you what color sari you should wear, what you shouldn't wear, what color. I don't even tell people if they want to wear gold, they can wear. If they don't want to wear, don't wear. I mean, I tell them if you read 1 Peter chapter 3 and 1 Timothy 2, you know what the word of God says. But... Whether you want to obey that or not, there's no compulsion. That's up to you. Everything is up to you. If you do it, do it for the glory of God. I mean, if you want to wear ornaments for the glory of God, go ahead and do it. And let the other person not wear for the glory of God. The point is everything must be for the glory of God. That's the point. That's what, it's a principle we say in the church. And uh, if you feel that uh, the only way you can keep your children from going away from home is by having some cartoons or something at home, okay, go ahead and do it. Maybe your motive is good in having a television at home. I'm not here to judge that. I'm not here to say, thou shalt, thou shalt not. I say, do all for the glory of God. And I'm not here to judge someone who does things differently from me. And I say, well, maybe he has not come up to that understanding yet. So Jesus always spoke like that. And that's one very important thing that all of us must learn in this Prayer. Now, many of you who have known me in CFC for 27 years, can you tell me that I have ever forced you, any of you to do anything? Can any of you get up and say, Brother Zach, you compelled me to do this? No. In 27 years, I never forced you. When I saw you going down a wrong path, I would warn you. I wouldn't catch you by the neck and pull you back. No. So it's up to you. If you want to go that way, you go. I have warned young sisters about how they should dress. I have um, warned brothers and sisters of various things, but I don't go catching them if they wear the type of dress which I don't recommend. That's not my business. Not at all. Because the spirit of the new covenant is freedom. But hold up the standard, not the freedom where, yeah, it doesn't matter if you don't give, doesn't matter if you don't pray, don't pass. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, when you give, give like this. Don't give to please impress men. Give to please God. Let it be in secret. When you give anything to God, when you pray, let it be something for God to know about. God will reward you secretly, openly. The same thing when it comes to the third one here in verse 16 of Matthew 6. When you fast, don't put on a gloomy face. Say, brother, what's wrong with you? Brother, I'm fasting. I've got a burden. What's the purpose of saying, telling that fellow you're fasting? You know, sometimes people say it in a more subtle way. You know, that time when God spoke to me once when I was on a 21-day fast, you know what God said to me, and I, I quickly go past it, uh, pretending that uh, the 21-day fast is unimportant, but that's the main point which those fellows want you to hear. And they hope you heard it. The other part is all unimportant. I have seen so much of this. 
You know, in Christendom, in this area of fasting, I have seen two groups of people. And very few people in the third group. Most people are in two groups. One group is those who never fast. They are completely free. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty to do whatever they like. <laughs> I'm misquoting that verse. They never fast. Okay. Then there are another group of people. Any time they fast, they keep a record of it. How many days? And somehow or the other, they must tell somebody about it. And get some credit for it from somebody, at least from one person. And we hope that one person will tell another person also that, uh, you know, this brother fasted and that is when God led him to do some wonderful thing. These are, I mean, if you remove these two groups from Christianity, those who never fast and those who fast and tell others, 99% of Christians are finished. But thank God there is another small 1%. You don't even know whether they fast or not. You'll never know because they never talk about it. They never bring it very subtly into their testimony or message. It's before God. I'm not saying it's wrong to mention. No. If a person, sometimes it may be right to mention that you read in the Bible about Daniel fasted. How did people know? He must have mentioned it. You read Ezra fasted. You read that Jesus fasted. How do you know that Jesus fasted? There was nobody with him in the wilderness. How do you know whether he was eating or not? He must have told his disciples. I was in the wilderness. What were you doing there, Lord? Well, I was fasting. So, no, you know, you can say it in a way that will challenge others for the glory of God. So I'm not making a rule here, thou shalt not give a testimony. That is another law. So I'm not going to bring a thou shalt not even into that area. All I'm saying is, do all for the glory of God. Do you want to testify about it? Maybe you should testify about it in some situation to challenge people who never fast. Okay, do it for the glory of God. But don't do it to draw attention to yourself. That's the point. So when Jesus said, when you fast, not if you fast, but when you fast, it means that he expected that his disciples will fast. Just like he did not say, if you give, Give it secretly? No. He said, when you give. That means he expected his disciples to give. Mainly to the poor, or for the work of the Lord, or whatever it is. In the Bible, in the New Testament, the emphasis is mainly on giving to the poor. Uh, Jesus never asked money for himself. The apostles never asked money for themselves. But today, a lot of emphasis on giving in Christianity is not for the poor. It's, I'm doing this work, and please support me, and... I'm doing this ministry and please support me and this is the organization and they set up an orphanage and the director of the orphanage gets half the money and the hundred orphans get the other half. It's a racket. It's all business racket. Particularly Bible schools and orphanages. Biggest rackets in India today. Be careful of these two things. But what I say is, Jesus said, uh, when you give to the poor, when he said, when you pray, uh, it doesn't mean that we should not pray in public, because Jesus prayed in public. The apostles had a public prayer meeting in a house when Peter was in prison. That is all correct. They didn't all go lock up in their rooms and uh, you can make that into a law and get into bondage again. You know, this, this desire to get under the law is there in almost everybody. <laughs> it's in our flesh. We prefer the law. Uh, we prefer rules and regulations because our forefather went to the knowledge of tree of knowledge of good and evil. He didn't go to the tree of life. But Jesus did not live by rules. He, he sensed, he, he lived by the Spirit. And he lived by the promptings of the Holy Spirit. In giving, when you give, when you pray, and when you fast. Now, I must confess that I do not know the real reason why God has told us to fast. I don't know all the reasons. But I also say, I don't need to know all the reasons. See, you know, in the military, one of the things that we were taught was to obey your superiors without questioning. Uh, if they say, fire! 
you don't say, well, why should I fire? I mean, give me five reasons why I should fire. They will put you in jail. You're ready for what's called a court-martial or being jailed. You're not supposed to ask questions. And particularly in the very important departments of the military called the commandos. Uh, I've heard that in the British Army, when they were training commandos in the Second World War, to go into German territory and do risky jobs where the only way they could be safe and protect others of their troops were by instant obedience, no questioning. And one way they would test these new recruits was teach them to obey orders. When you are told, quick march, quick march. And you don't stop till you are told to halt. So, you know, they were all put on a you know what a jetty is? A jetty is a long uh, wall that sticks out into the sea where the ships come and tie. And they were asked to get onto this jetty and quick march. And they march and march and march and march and march. And when they come to the end of the jetty, all those who had some common sense stopped. Three or four people didn't stop because they didn't get any word to halt and fell into the sea. They selected those four who fell into the sea. Because those are the fellows who will obey without using their head. And all the fellows with common sense, they say, you can go back home. You're not fit for commando duty. And I believe it's something like that with Jesus too. You know, people who say, Lord, why should I do that? Give me five reasons why I should do that. God says, you better go home. Go and do something else. Don't waste your time trying to be my disciple. It won't work. You're not fit for commando duty. Uh, go and read the newspaper or... Go and sit at home and do something else. To be a disciple is a serious thing. And uh, so, I don't need to know all the reasons why I should fast. Jesus has said, He has given an example in His life. The apostles practiced it in their life. And uh, I see it taught by Jesus. I see it taught by the apostles also. And I say, even if I don't understand any other reasons for it, I obey. It's like baptism. You know, I understood the meaning of Romans 6 many, many years after I got baptized. Now, today you're in a good church where you can, the meaning of baptism is explained to you so clearly before you get baptized. Well, praise the Lord. But um, it's like, if I were to ask you, can you explain your digestive system? I'm 63 years old, I still can't explain it. But 63 years, I've never had a problem with the digestive system. I don't need to understand how it works for it to work. But here's a doctor who can explain it, and he may be having a problem with his digestive system. Explanation doesn't mean that the system is working properly. It's good to understand it. But it's not necessary. Do you understand how your heart works? Do you understand how the blood flows? And do you understand how this breathing oxygen gets turned into carbon dioxide and gets pumped out of the body? You don't know all that, but it still works. So many things happen in our body. Why do we eat certain foods and avoid certain other foods? You don't know what all it causes inside. But you say other people have studied it and they say it's not good. So I avoid it. You know, they say if you if you got diabetes, you shouldn't eat too much sugar or sweets. Yeah, I mean, if you ask the person who's avoiding the sugar, why are you avoiding it? <laughs> Can you explain what happens inside your body with insulin or all that? They don't know. They probably never heard of insulin. But, you see, we don't follow our understanding necessarily in so many things in life. When you eat your food, do you know what actually happens to the food in your stomach? How does it get converted into blood and flesh and bones? You don't know at all. A doctor can explain it. But your digestive system is just as good as the doctor's and probably better than the doctor's. Even though you don't understand it. Now if that is the case, when we come to things like prayer and fasting, I'll tell you honestly, like my digestive system, I don't always understand why. For example, prayer which we thought about yesterday. 
Why do I need to tell God about something which he already knows? Am I informing him, God, there is a problem here in India that uh, the fundamentalist people are attacking the Christians? And God says, really, is that happening? No, he knew about it long before you read it in the newspapers or anything. What are you? Are you informing God? No. Do you have a great burden for those suffering missionaries in North India? Do you think God doesn't have a burden for his children? That fellow is not even related to you, but he's one of God's children. He's, God is seeing it. You only read it. So we cannot give God a burden for that person. He already loves him. He already knows about it. Why in the world am I praying? I'm praying because Jesus told me to pray. And I'll tell you something, it works. And I'm absolutely convinced that there are things I have got from God in prayer that I would never have got if I had not prayed. When I started preaching, I specifically asked God for the gift of prophecy, for the anointing. Otherwise, I'd never have got it. How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? What about those who don't ask? Who say, yeah, whatever will happen, will happen. If God wants to give me the Holy Spirit, he'll give me. If he doesn't want to give me, that's up to him. I'll tell you, he'll never get it. Who gets the power of the Holy Spirit? The one who seeks God with all his heart. Who? The Bible says, you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And it's part of that searching with all our heart that makes me passionate after God. That detaches me from earthly things which is involved in fasting. Fasting is a form of self-denial. I told you that God runs this world on the principle of sacrifice. That means when I have money, I can spend all that money on myself or I can sacrifice and give some of that and deny myself something so that I can give that money for God's work or to some poor person or something like that. That is sacrifice. And since God runs this world on the principle of sacrifice, that's what is proved on the cross of Calvary. And we saw that yesterday in Genesis 3. When I get also in sync, synchron- in, uh, I'm in sync as they say, synchronized with God into this principle of sacrifice, I get the benefit. It can be in giving, it can be in praying, where I don't live with this self-confidence. See, a person who is strong doesn't pray. It's only a person who is weak. Pray and say, God, I need you. See, prayer is just confessing my weakness to God. That's all. Prayer is opening my heart and say, Lord Jesus, come in. That's prayer. Lord, I'm weak. Help me. It's confessing my weakness to God. A strong person doesn't pray because he doesn't feel he's, he needs any help from God. And fasting also is an expression of the intensity of our desire for something we are praying for. That's why fasting is usually linked with prayer. Fast and pray. And, um, you know, when there's a particularly pressing problem, something that has not been solved for some time, maybe someplace the devil has entrenched himself, maybe some new direction the Lord is leading you. You know, God may lead us to fast. Maybe one day, maybe two days, maybe three days. To, you know, just drink water or juice or something like that and not eat any solid food. Uh, Or deny ourselves in some way in the area of food. For example, in Daniel, we read in chapter Ten, Daniel chapter 10 and verse 3 verse 2 in those days I Daniel had been mourning for three entire weeks I did not eat any tasty food nor did meat or wine enter my mouth 
nor did I use any ointment or oil on my body for three weeks. This was not a total fast. This is another type of fast where uh, he ate vegetarian food for three weeks, denied himself some luxuries. I mean like saying that I won't eat anything which I like. I'll just keep my, uh, quench my hunger and uh, just keep myself eating very little. That's also a fast. So if you can't fast completely, you can fast partially like Daniel did. It's called a fast in the Bible. I, uh, I was mourning and I did not eat any tasty food and that is a form of fast. And then at the end of this three weeks, it says on the 24th day of the first month, I, I saw a vision. A man came and uh, the man said, Oh Daniel, verse 11, understand what I am telling you. Don't be afraid, Daniel, verse 12, because from the first day of your fast, not after 21 days, from the very first day when you decided to fast for 21 days, you set your heart on understanding this and on humbling yourself before your God. Now the Bible says that fasting is one way which, which we humble ourselves. The psalmist says, I humbled my soul with fasting. The first day your words were heard, God saw one man on earth who was serious. How was he serious? He had denied himself certain tasty food for three weeks. Now that's an encouragement for us. I mean, if, some, if you can't suddenly begin to fast with um, skipping all your meals, even for a day, start with denying yourself. You know, go step by step, go into the lower kindergarten, then the upper kindergarten. Start with denying yourself, maybe for one or two days or one week, tasty food. And then you see some benefit coming out of this type of fasting. He say, hey, this works. And then you can gradually move on to skipping maybe one meal a day, or another time two meals a day, and three meals a day, and with a purpose. And don't tell anybody about it. Don't spoil the whole thing by telling people about it. And just do it secretly before God. And do it at a time when you don't have a lot of intense physical work to do. Choose a day like that. And, uh, and seek God. I'm not saying you've got to be on your knees all the time. But uh, let it be an expression of your humbling yourself before God. You're seeking God intensely. You see, it says here, you set your heart, verse 12, on understanding this. And humbling yourself before God. You know, if you read the previous chapter, it says there that Daniel looked into the word of God and he saw that uh, the word of God had said that um, 70 years, Daniel chapter 9 verse 2, was Israel would be judged for 70 years in Babylon. And he looked at the calendar and he said, Hey, I came to Babylon 70 years ago. He was 87 years old in Daniel chapter 9. 70 years is up. And Jeremiah said very clearly, 70 years. So what did he do? He didn't sit back in his AC chair and say, oh, well, God will fulfill his promise. No. He said, when I saw this in the scripture, that after 70 years, God's people must go back to Israel and build the temple. He says in verse 3, I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and supplication with fasting. And I prayed and I confessed and I said, God, do something. And you read that wonderful prayer there. See, that means his fasting came out of seeing something in God's word that had to be fulfilled and it was not being fulfilled and everybody was lazily sitting in their easy chairs. He said, okay, I'm going to seek God. Now, when you see something in the scriptures which needs to be fulfilled, like you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit and you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, what do you do? You begin to say, okay, I've got to seek God about this. I don't want any cheap counterfeit. I want the real thing. Or you're an elder in a church. And you begin to see God because all the young people are wayward and there's a strife and controversy and competition and uh, wrong spirits in your church. And you need to see God. Or uh, everybody thinks you're boring and you've got no word from God to build up the church. And you need to see God with fasting. Or you're organizing some special meetings in your church to reach out to some people. And maybe for a few days before the special meeting, you're really seeking God with fasting and prayer. You say, why? 
Listen, don't ask me why. That's like asking me, how does your digestive system work? I don't know. Don't ask me how it works. I know it works. That's all I can say. It's like my digestive system. It's like my heart. It's like my breathing. It's like a, a thousand things in my body which I can't explain. Include thousand and one prayer, thousand and two fasting. That's all. I don't know. It works. That's all I can say. And if you have not ever done it, you have missed something. And when you begin to do it, you will gradually realize the need to do it regularly. That's up to you, once a month or once a week. The Pharisee said, I fast twice a week. The Pharisees fasted twice a week. And Jesus said, your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. Are the Pharisees going to put us to shame? You read in Luke 18, Lord, I fast twice a week, the Pharisees said. He wasn't telling a lie. So, it's possible that some of us, we are talking in these days about filling up what is lacking, that which is missing. And I believe these are three areas that we have looked at these three evenings, which are seriously missing. In many of our lives, giving, secret giving, secret praying, and secret fasting. I, I want you to think about that because we have not understood this principle of sacrifice by which God is running this universe. So this angel came to Daniel in Daniel chapter 10 and said, you know, right from the first day, you began to seek God and things began to move. It didn't all happen in a day, but things started moving from the time one man on earth was praying. And what happened? <clears throat> he says, this was this angel who came. We don't know what his name was. He says he's a man dressed in linen, verse 5, whose waist was girded with the belt of pure gold and so on. And he said, I, want, I was trying to come to you, but, verse 13 of chapter 10, the evil prince... This is speaking about a demonic spirit that was in charge of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. Now usually when I talk about such subjects the lights go off or something so just be ready for something like that. Eh? Okay. <laughs> this is serious stuff. Um, the demonic spirits that were were resisting me for 21 days. Daniel didn't know that. He just had a burden to pray. And fast. And not, it's not a total fast. He had his job to do. He was a, like a chief minister. Prime minister of that country. He had to go to his office and do so many things. And so he would eat a little vegetarian light breakfast and light lunch and light dinner. Because he was fasting. And in between he would pray to God and say, God. And after 21 days... His burden lifted. It's okay. Now I can have a good meal. And then this angel comes and says, Hey, you know what happened all these 21 days? Because you prayed, I got through. And it says here, Michael, one of the archangels, verse 13, came to help me because I was struggling with those evil demonic spirits of Persia. And now I've come to give you an understanding of what will happen to your people in the latter days and when he had spoken to me I turned my face to the ground and became speechless and someone touched my lips and opened my mouth and said and I said to him oh Lord I have become I have lost my strength how can I talk and he touched me again verse 18 and strengthened me and said oh man of high esteem don't be afraid and then I got strength verse 19 and he said, do you know why I have come to you? Verse 20, I am going to return to fight against the prince of Persia. And then after that, the prince of Greece is going to come. Another evil spirit. I will tell you the truth. And he goes on and gives Daniel revelation. You know that a revelation comes very often through fasting and prayer and seeking God for guidance. God is looking He's not, God doesn't delight in seeing us hungry. No, which father will delight to see his children hungry? But I like to see my children disciplined. 
every general would like his soldiers to be disciplined and fasting helps in discipline it has many many byproducts for example when you fast you understand how hungry people feel in the world if you want to know how all the hungry people who beg for food feel you can never know how they feel till you skip your meals for two full days you try skipping your meals for two full days you'll know exactly how that poor hungry boy begging for food feels like otherwise you'll never know it'll be the all theory and uh, it disciplines your body by products are you become healthier you don't get so sick i think a lot of people are sick because they eat too much not because they don't eat too much i mean you can starve to death too that's one extreme but at the other end are these people who eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and they get sick uh, my wife used to tell me that when she was in velour hospital there were certain diseases called rich people's diseases because only rich people get those diseases because they have so much food and uh, so much rich food and the poor people who are struggling and working never get those diseases you know that some of us have got rich people's diseases and what's the use asking somebody to come brother please lay your hands on me anoint me with oil and pray lord teach this person to fast that's what is it pray <laughs> what else to pray what shall we pray lord let this fellow eat and eat and be a glutton and but heal him no i really believe that many of us need to learn something here christianity is not a picnic it's a battle and uh, you know if you are a person doing a lot of physical work like carrying bricks and mortar like all these people who build i don't think anybody here in a construction business or you know plowing the field like farmers there are some of our brothers why not area and all that nelipur era who are farmers they got to do a lot of physical work i mean there i can understand they they need to eat well but most of us we don't need to eat three meals a day i'll tell you this absolutely honestly most of us who sit in a chair and get up from the chair and sit on a scooter and get down from the scooter and go and sit on another chair and then go and sleep in a bed and get up in the morning and go and sit in another chair and get up from the chair and go and sit in a scooter and go to work and sit in another chair and spend our whole day like that we don't need three meals a day i'll tell you honestly you'll probably be much healthier and i'm not saying if you're below 25 or something please you need to build up your health but i'm talking about if you're older than 25 Uh, you can easily get by on two meals a day you'll be healthier and um, if you save some money through skipping one meal a day give that money for god that's another by product of skipping a meal uh, and there's so many wonderful things you know by products of fasting you're more disciplined you're more fit and uh, you got to keep your body under control Do you know the apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 1 Corinthians chapter 9 he said He says don't you know that every those who run in a race verse 24 all run but only one receives the prize You know how these people compete for the Olympic games they practice for years they practice and practice and practice and practice and practice for years before they uh um, finally go for that olympic games and then one receives the prize run in such a way that you may win that means in the christian race everybody can receive the prize provided he runs in a way wanting to come first that's the meaning It's not only one prize in heaven you can all get a prize but you must run in the same way the fellow practices who wants to come first and we can all practice that way that means the one who competes in these games they had olympic games even in those days exercises self control in all things he exercises self control in his eating i was reading somewhere You know what push-ups are? Uh you put your hand on the ground and 
and i read somewhere the best way to stay healthy is to do push-ups from the dining table <laughs> you know after you've eaten enough do a push-up and go wash your hands and it's really true i believe a lot of us eat too much self control they do it to receive a perishable wreath but we are disciplining ourselves to receive an imperishable crown so he says that's how i run i don't run in such a way as if i don't got any aim it doesn't matter whether i don't finish the race or not no he says i run with an aim to come first and he says when i box i don't just beat the air i got a punching bag and i keep hammering it and i really i buffet my body and make it my slave and the living bible paraphrase of that is excellent i teach my body i train my body to do what it should do and not what it wants to do fasting can apply to many areas it's not just from food the principle is the principle of self denial i deny myself something which can make my life a little more comfortable it could be food a thing for example if you got a terrible problem with your tongue try fasting from giving your opinion for one week suppose you say for one week i'm going to fast from giving my opinion on any subject you you'll find it tough i'll tell you that those who are always wanting to give their opinion on every subject just try and fast for one week from that you know self control uh maybe deny myself something i remember reading the story of david wilkerson the man whom god used to bring so many drug addicts uh to the lord i remember hearing the testimony of one of the di- directors of his work when i was attending that church in times square in new york and that man who got up and said he was a now a director of that teen challenge work working among drug addicts but he said he himself was a drug addict he says i was a drug addict lying in the gutters of boston nobody cared for me no church no pastor till david wilkerson came by and picked me up and brought me to the lord and today i'm a servant of the lord i say praise god for such men and god has used that brother in a wonderful way to bring so many drug addicts to christ and his life story is in that book the cross and the switchblade i would really encourage you to read that a tremendous book a very humble man this brother even now and you know there's one thing that i don't remember most of that book but there's one thing i read in that book i'll never forget his whole ministry when he was a 27 year old young pastor started with one little act of self denial his entire worldwide ministry today started with one little act of self denial when he was 27 years old he had the habit of watching television for maybe i don't know half an hour or whatever length of time every evening and one day he felt the spirit of god saying why don't you stop give up that half an hour this is self denial you know people who enjoy watching he wasn't watching filthy things oh no he wasn't watching filthy movies or any such thing it's just maybe entertainment or whatever it is and uh, the spirit of god said okay you're not watching sinful things but why don't you give up that for spend that half an hour which you're devoting to tv every day in prayer and this young 27 year old man did it i don't remember now whether he got rid of his television or just turned it off but he devoted that time to prayer and it was in one of those times of prayer that he saw this news in the newspaper of certain people who were being uh tried in a court young people in new york and decided to go he felt the leading it all started from that that he decided to spend a certain amount of time every day just half an hour in prayer and from that began you know like from a little trickle came a mighty river i have never forgotten that for one reason that 
I have often thought like that. Just suppose he had disobeyed God in that one small point. Suppose he had said, Lord, I'm not watching anything dirty. After all, I need some relaxation for my mind. And the Lord had said, okay, that's fine. Just go ahead. He wouldn't have gone to hell. He wouldn't have lost his salvation or anything because he was not watching filthy stuff. It was just relaxation. You'd never have heard of him. I, I'm absolutely sure of that. There would have been no book called The Cross and the Switchblade. God would have still done his work, but he would have done it through somebody else. And is it possible that God has got a ministry for you? But he's going to do it through somebody else. Because when he tells you to deny yourself in some area, you justify yourself and say this and that and the other. And God says, okay, okay, I won't disturb you. Just go ahead and keep on doing what you want to do. Is it possible, my brothers, that some of you have missed what God wanted to do through you because you were indisciplined? Is it possible? But something God spoke to you. And you justified yourself and said, no, it's okay. Okay. God won't force you. He doesn't say, thou shalt. Thou shalt not. No, 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 no. It's all Old Testament. He says, if, when. It's up to you. There's no thou shalt or thou shalt not. It's if and when. If. Well, you say, no, it's, there's no thou shalt. Where does it say in the Bible, thou shalt? No, it, it doesn't. It says, if. And it says when. So you say, yeah, I can do. It says when. So that means up to me. Right, it's up to you. Absolutely up to you. You don't have to do it. But see the result in your life. <laughs> of living that way of indisciplined life. So Paul says, I keep my body under subjection. Otherwise, after I preach so many wonderful messages to others, I will be disqualified myself. Do you know that a preacher who does not discipline his body can be disqualified? So fasting is a help there. You know, that I deny myself. For example, if I feel that reading a novel. You say, is it right to read novels? Yeah, it's okay. But if you find that reading a novel tends to produce certain types of thoughts, romantic thoughts, and you begin to daydream and you lose your love for the Bible. You know, like you saw in the skit, devil's caught you with step number one. So, fasting is a help. I want to show you another verse in Matthew 17. In Matthew 17 we read about a man whose child was a lunatic and was, being, was jumping into the fire and he says these words. These are very sad words. Lord, verse 16, I brought my child to your disciples and they could not cure him. Lord, is it your will that a human being should be possessed by a demon? I brought him to your disciples. They yelled and screamed and shouted and all that, and the demon is still there. And Jesus said, Oh, unbelieving and perverted generation. Who is he talking about? His twelve disciples. Oh, unbelieving and perverted generation. I gave you authority over demons. And you can't cast out this demon. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And he cast out the demon with a word. The disciples came to him and said, Why couldn't we cast him out? You did it so quickly. He said, Because you don't have faith. You don't have faith. That's why, verse 20, the littleness of your faith. But, you know why you don't have faith? Verse 21, you've got to pray and fast. This kind of demon will not go out except by prayer and fasting. I was greatly encouraged once when I read this word where it says in Matthew 8 verse 16. In the last part of the verse it says, he cast out the spirits with a word. He cast out the spirits with one word. I've been challenged by that. That means if I exercise the authority in the name of Jesus over a demon-possessed person, 
I do not have to ask the demon to leave that body more than once. In the name of Jesus, get out of him. Get out of her. One word. Now that's not what you normally see in a lot of casting out demons that go on in a lot of um, those type of assemblies. They yell and they scream. I've seen some pastors spitting and uh, cursing and calling the devil all types of names and, and the demon is still there. He says that the demon's making a face at him and say, Ah, you can't get me. Jesus I know and Paul I know. Who do you think you are? I say, if you have to do all that, you must stop. I say, if you have to yell and scream at a demon and it doesn't go, stop. Go and fast and pray. Come back a few weeks later. Then cast it out with a word. The devil is not bothered about my word, but the mighty name of Jesus. It is a question of who is using that name. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. See, when Daniel prayed, the evil prince of Persia, the demonic spirit, could fight with all those angels. But today, that was before Calvary. Before Calvary, the demons were free. But today, those demons can't do that. You can't, demon can't fight with, for 21 days today. They were all defeated on the cross. Their armor has been taken away. In Daniel's day, the armor was not taken away. That's why they had to, they could struggle and fight for 21 days, even with the angels in heaven. Not today. The Bible says in Colossians 2.14, the demons were, armor has been taken away from them and we've got authority now in the name of Jesus. But to exercise that authority over the devil, has the devil got into your home? Has the devil got into your church? Has the devil got into some situation? Has the devil got into one of your children? Fast and pray and seek God. And, as, and when the Lord leads you, go to that devil and in one word, tell him to get out of that situation. Do you know that you and I should be exercising that authority? This is not for full-time workers or certain preachers or pastors. It is for every believer to exercise this authority in prayer and fasting. One last thing. 1 Corinthians 7 also speaks about fasting in the sexual area, not just in food. It says a husband and wife may sometimes, by agreement, by mutual agreement, verse 5, stay apart. Because they want to devote themselves, 1 Corinthians 7, 5, to prayer and fasting. So it's not just in the area of food. It could be in the area of legitimate lawful sex in married life. It could be in the area of entertainment. It could be like not watching television for a certain time because you want to spend that time which you spend every day on TV in prayer or something like that. It's a self-discipline. It's a discipline. So that I can be available to God. I'm intense. I'm serious about my pursuit of God. Brothers and sisters, consider whether we have come short. Do you want God to fill up the circle in these areas? I believe you'll be healthier. I believe you'll be more spiritual in your own personal life. And I believe your ministry will be far more effective. I believe your, your words will be sharper and gradually it can become a discipline in your life that you say, yeah, and those of us who are in responsibility in churches, I believe that we should do it on a more regular basis than other believers. And when you face a crisis in your church, I would recommend three days of fasting and prayer. Keep yourself away from solid food. and If you haven't done it, start with partial fast. Just one meal, two meals, three meals. And really seek God. I tell you, we're not trying to convince God about anything. We're just obeying His word. 
let me say one more thing and that is this is not a law don't go and think i learned a technique now this is not a technique no if it doesn't come out of love for jesus if it doesn't come as a desire for the glory of god it's a waste of time don't start with fasting no start with praying hallowed be thy name that comes before fasting in matthew 6 when you get past that thy kingdom come thy will be done then we can go in other words your aim should be the glory of god i hope we have learned something in the bible studies in these three days that we can fill up something which is lacking i don't know how many of you will take it really seriously in your life i hope some of you young people will take it seriously in your life in this area don't just jump to do fantastic things go slowly and say lord in these three areas i want to be a little more disciplined and you'll see by next year this time you'll be a different person you'll have authority in your life you'll be healthier more spiritual and your life will be a greater blessing in your local church amen let's pray heavenly father apply these truths that we have heard to everyone here that that we don't forget them because the birds of the air are here to take away the seed sown i pray they won't succeed i pray that there'll be fruit that lasts for eternity in every life in jesus name we pray you are invited to visit our website on the internet at www.cfcindia.com that is www. cfc i n d i a dot com and at punan dot o r g forward slash zac that is p o o n e n dot o r g forward slash z a c for video messages audio messages and books by zac punan that can all be downloaded freely our mailing address is christian fellowship center 40 de costa square bangalore 560084 india if you would like to receive a weekly message by zac punan by email please go to our website and send us an email to the address given there the lord bless you richly